ghosts, witches, pumpkins. They are all symbols of Halloween, but when you think about it, where did they all come from? So hello everyone, <laughs> welcome back. I actually can't believe it, it is already the Halloween season. That's where this year has gone. So I thought I would spend this month, or at least attempt to, uh, deep diving into Ray Bradbury's The Halloween Tree. Now, I love Halloween and I love exploring history, so this book is perfect for this month because it explores all the different influences from across time and different cultures and how they've all been merged and adapted to become the Halloween that we know today. So Ray Bradbury takes us across time and different countries from ancient Egypt all the way through to Mexico for the Day of the Dead. Um, and basically it's his way, in a fun way, of showing how all the different symbols and customs from different uh, cultural celebrations have been collected. And not just that, they he also explores the different relationships that the different cultures have with death. So not just death of life, um, it really shows the relationship between death of the sun and the seasons. So, um, I know we've made pumpkin pie before for Sleepy Hollow, but it is mentioned again in the Halloween tree right at the beginning, so it's the 1970s. And I thought, you know what? It's October. Let's make pumpkin pie. Let's carve pumpkins. I thought I might just kind of chat through some of the history of pumpkins and the jack-o'-lanterns that I found along the way. So here's the thing about tracing the history of customs and traditions. There is never one perfect linear line from A to B. So cultural celebrations can be traced back hundreds to thousands of years. And during that time, a lot happens. So these cultures often spread out um, across what we now know as different countries. You know, over hundreds of years, customs, they, they come, they go, people move. They evolve their way of doing things to cert suit a certain time or place. And then they also pick up new customs and then they make it their own. So when we talk about tracing something like the jack-o'-lantern, there's really no perfect story. So today we obviously associate the jack-o'-lantern as being Halloween specific. In fact, when I was reading up on this, the reasonings behind jack-o'-lanterns likely come from a whole series of different events that span from October 30th through to November 2nd, and they also never come from just like one moment in time. They're also not just Irish, and they're not just linked with so on, um, which is where Halloween originally comes from. Instead, there's like a whole series of customs and reasons that probably play a role as to why we carve faces into pumpkins today, and then call them a jack-o'-lantern. So one of the practical reasons I came across behind carving out vegetables is that end of October, beginning of November, the harvest would have been done. Now we're going back to probably the Middle Ages with the story, I couldn't quite pin it down, um, but we're talking 1,500 years ago to approximately 600 years ago. So it's kind of a, a very big gap of time. But around this time, um, with the harvest done, it meant that there was actually quite a few fairs that went on. Um, I guess it was a good time to celebrate, and this is across Great Britain. Now, this story is specific, apparently, to the southwest of England. However, I've also come across other stories where they say it comes back to Scotland. Basically, it depends on what vegetable is mentioned. So, the three alternative stories go with these fairs. Basically, husbands and sons would go, and they might have gotten just a little sloshed. So women would put a candle in a carved root vegetable. Some suggest it was a mangold, which is like a very big root vegetable. It kind of looks like a cross between um, like a beet and a turnip, but kind of like longer. Anyways, they would use this so the men knew how to get home. Another alternative to the story is the women used the lanterns to go collect the husbands themselves. And then the third story is that the men came up with this brilliant idea themselves when they were somehow stumbling around drunk and ended up in a turnip patch and then they had their light bulb moment then. Whatever you, the story and whichever one you would like to believe, um, the custom evolved and carving of mangolds and root vegetables in general is actually still celebrated and it's called Punky Night. So that's a practical reason behind carving out the vegetables. 
The mystical version is linked with the Celts and so on. Now, I won't go deeply into so on in this video, but one of the beliefs that kind of carried through was that this was a time of magic, and that includes fairies, um, but it's also a time when spirits of the dead were, I don't want to say that they came back to earth, but one way it was described was that like the veil is thinner. So another thing I read that probably puts in better perspective is the relationship that the Celts had with magic, it wasn't a belief. Um, it was just something that was. One author described it perfectly. They basically said, that would be like us believing in the weather. So for them, it's like you don't believe in the weather. It's not like you believed in magic. It just simply was. So with this time, with the spirits being able to roam around, with the good come the bad. So for those spirits who were welcome, a candle was lit and root vegetables like turnips were used as a lantern. On the flip side, it's also suggested that to ward off the evil spirits, a ghoulish face was carved in. And that's the mystical version for carving vegetables. So whatever the reasoning, um, the custom has obviously stuck because here we are carving faces into pumpkins. So pumpkins are solidly North American. So that was the easiest thing for people from Great Britain and Ireland to get their hands on when they immigrated to the US and Canada. So the 1800s obviously saw a huge influx in immigration from Ireland. Um, whenever I read up on Halloween coming across, there's always this focus on the Irish. And it's true, they would have brought their celebration. But the British have also been immigrating to the US since the 1600s. Um, it has come in waves, but that's also 400 years of customs sort of trickling across. So based on the fact that all these stories have not just come from Ireland, but all of Great Britain and Ireland, um, it's likely that all of these have sort of come across, hitched a ride with thousands of people and sort of merged to become the customs that we know today. So as for the name, jack o -lantern, the most clear-cut story I came across is an old Irish tale. So in the Irish marshes, bogs and swamps, flickering lights can occur. So from a science perspective, it's explained as gases that come from rotting vegetation and they suddenly ignite into flameless gas. And somehow they move and they burn before the gases finally burn out. But there's an old Irish folk story that was written down in the 1800s, but the story goes back to the 1600s at least, explaining this phenomenon in a different way. So these lights are known as Will-o'-the-Wisp, but they're also known as Jack-o'-the-Lantern. So the story goes that Jack, one day, comes across an angel who is disguised as a homeless wanderer. So quite out of character, Jack decides to help them. In return, the angel gives Jack three wishes. But Jack is known for being unsocial, with quite a temper, and lacking in generosity. And in that moment, he proves it. His wishes were, whoever sat in his chair would become stuck. Whoever touches his toolbox would not be able to remove their hand, and whoever goes to snap a branch from his sycamore tree stays clung to the tree until he releases them. The angel grants the wishes, but in that moment also bars Jack from heaven. Twenty years later, death, in the form of Satan's messengers, since Jack has been barred from heaven, comes to take Jack. But he tricks them first. First with his chair, then his toolbox, only releasing them when they promise not to return. Finally, Satan himself comes and Jack uses the sycamore tree to trap him until he promises to not take Jack or take him to hell. Eventually, nature does take its toll on Jack, but with no entrance to heaven and no entrance to hell, he is forced to walk the earth with only a lantern to light the way. It's suggested in one version that the devil gives Jack an ember, and Jack places this in a carved out turnip, and this becomes his lantern. So it's suggested that the name Jack the Lantern is that creature that walks in the marshes with his treacherous lantern. So obviously I've told you the stories of why people have lit root vegetables in the past to safely guide their family members home. So it's suggested that these moving lights in the Irish bogs trick people into thinking they should follow. So the story goes that the easiest way to get rid of the trick is to turn your clothing inside out before you put them back on. 
So only then could you rid yourself of Jack the Lantern. And so whew, here we are. Um, even in that story, you know, you can hear the beginnings of tricks, which of course leads into other customs and other nights of celebration. So somewhere along the way, at different points, these customs and these stories have converged. And the stories really, they don't need to fit together perfectly. You know, history often includes customs that are just woven together, like a bit like a patchwork. It doesn't look perfect and that is perfectly okay. All that we know is because of the stories and customs, we are here today carving a pumpkin with a very scary face. So obviously I've been making pumpkin pie in the background. Um, so first up was the pumpkin pie crust. To make this easy, I'm just gonna pop the recipe link down below. It's the same one I used when I made the Sleepy Hollow pies. Obviously you saw a different type of pumpkin show up. That is the butternut squash that I am using to cook. You can also get your hands on sugar pumpkins. Those are really good for baking. I sliced up my squash, popped them in the oven with a little bit of water, and I've cooked it for about an hour. So with that baked, I am taking one and a half cups of that pumpkin puree. I'm going to pop in two tablespoons of butter, and just because of that heat, that's gonna help melt that down. Then I'm gonna scoop in three-fourths of a cup of brown sugar, and I'm gonna give that a really good stir. That's gonna, again, with that heat, um, it's gonna start melting some of that sugar into the pumpkin mix. Then I'm going to whisk in two eggs before pouring in three-fourths of a cup of milk and then another three-fourths of a cup of cream. Again, with another really good stir, just mixing that all together. Then I'm going to grab just a little pinch of salt. It's probably about half to three-fourths of a teaspoon. And then the best part, the pumpkin pie spice. So it's probably about two and a half teaspoons that I'm pouring in here. Sometimes I add a little bit more, but I'm gonna give that a little stir. And then I'm gonna pour all that mixture into my pie crust. Now it's ready to go in the oven. Before I started cooking this, I did preheat my oven to 230 degrees Celsius or 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, just to heat up and then the moment I'm ready to pop my pie into the oven I reduce the heat to 160 degrees Celsius or 325 Fahrenheit and I bake that for 50 to 60 minutes but you're gonna know because when you press a knife into the center that should come out relatively clean and I like to roll out just a little bit of the leftover pastry crust and I cut out some pumpkin shapes. I usually bake these separately and then I pop them on top of the pie once they are all baked. So there we go. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It is actually really good to be back and researching and um, sharing what I find with you guys. So I will see you guys next time.